You may remember that I mentioned in my previous message that we all have this problem of sin. Remember, this is true no matter what religion you were born into. As a result, we're facing the punishment of being cut off from God's presence forever. And this is pretty serious. This is a matter of life and death in the only way that life and death really has meaning. And if you really meditated on what we thought about last time, it should have caused, and this was my hope, it should have caused an eagerness in you to know how to solve the problem. And that's what we'll talk about today. Imagine that I went to a doctor who told me that I had a serious form of cancer. I would immediately say, well, doctor, how serious is it? Can you cure it? In many cases, sadly, cancer is incurable. And that is sad news indeed. But the truth about Jesus Christ is called the gospel. You may have heard that word, but it essentially means good news. Here's the good news, my dear friends. Solving our problem of sin is not easy. Many people think that if they've done a lot of bad things, they can try to make up for it by doing more good things. Thus, the balance of scales will shift to the good side. And they hope that by the end of their life, the good side is a little heavier than the bad side. But even if the number of good things you did is more than the number of sins that you committed, that doesn't remove the sins that you committed. They're still there on the other side. And let's face it, those good deeds may look honorable by earthly standards, and everybody may be impressed by them, including ourselves, but they can never meet the standard of perfection of God's goodness. Never. And in any case, the sins that I committed are still there on the other side of the scale. And as I said last time, even one sin prevents me from being near God and having that fellowship with him. I need a way for my sins to be completely removed. You know, God is perfect. He's perfectly merciful, but he's also perfectly just. So if God was to feel sorry for me and say, oh, you poor thing, you have no way to get out of the mess that you're in, so I'll just ignore it. That's a false love. Yes, it may seem like God is being merciful there, but he is not being just. God is perfectly merciful and perfectly just. Let me give you an example. Let's say I committed a horrible crime, and here I am standing in the Supreme Court, and the judge happens to be my father. My father loves me very much, and I could stand there hoping that because he's my father, he might let me off. Now, if he was to let me off because of his love for me, you would have to say that he is a corrupt judge. So God has to say, guilty, sentenced to death. But as they're about to take me away in chains, the judge says, hold on, son. I can't let this crime go unpunished, but I love you so much. So instead of you dying, I'm going to let them take me away and put me to death. You see how God is both perfectly just and perfectly merciful in doing that? Here's what that story means for us. Firstly, the punishment of sin has to be paid by a man because we humans, it is we humans who have sinned. The punishment also has to be paid by an innocent man. Otherwise, the pay payment is not acceptable. It has to be somebody who has never sinned. And thirdly, since the punishment for sin is eternal death, only God, who is eternal, can experience that punishment in a fixed time so that the payment can be made for me. 
So in order for the punishment for my sin to be paid fully, God must live a sinless life as a man and then die for my sins. I hope that makes sense to you. I hope I explained that clearly. And this is exactly what Jesus did. Almost 2,000 years ago, Jesus, who is the only God, lived here on earth for 33 years without ever sinning even once. This is very important to remember. It had to be a sinless sacrifice. And then at the end of his life, he was killed by people who hated him. And yet, God turned even that hatred and that horrible act of them crucifying God into tremendous good. Because as a result, that perfect penalty was paid. And all that evil that people schemed against God, inspired by the devil, instigated by the devil, God turned into our good. And the penalty for sin was fully paid. And since he was the son of God and a perfectly sinless man, he couldn't stay dead forever. And I'm sure you've heard the story. Three days later, he rose up from the grave. But my dear friends, God's love is endless. It doesn't stop there. Not only does he forgive our sins, he also calls us righteous, treating us as if we had never sinned at all. God's forgiveness and what's called justification is so perfect that God can forgive you because of the penalty and the sacrifice that Jesus paid. And he looks at you as if you'd never done anything wrong in your life. Imagine that you owned a billion rupees to somebody. Now, it would be extremely generous and kind of them to forgive that billion rupees. But if that's all they did, you're still a beggar. You still don't have any money. There's zero rupees in your bank account. But if that person is kind enough to give you another billion rupees, now you can live like a rich person. And this is what God did for us when Jesus rose from the dead. This is what Romans 4 verse 25 says. He who was delivered over because of our transgressions was raised because of our justification. That's what justification means. Just as if I had never sinned at all. But listen, God's still not done. There's more. After making us rich, he offers to come live with us and teach us how to use those riches. We're talking about spiritual riches now. How to use those riches wisely so that we don't lose all of it and end up in debt all over again. Since Jesus lived on this earth from the time he was born for 33 years until he died without ever sinning, he can walk with you day by day and lead you also to be fully freed from sin, little by little. This is good news. But there is so much more that God did on the cross. In fact, we can never have enough time to describe all that God did on the cross. But I want to mention one more. You see, we have two big enemies, death and the devil. And when Jesus died and rose again, he defeated both of those enemies so that you don't ever have to live in the fear of death. You don't have to spend one day afraid of death if you really trust Jesus Christ. And you don't have to spend one day afraid of the devil if you really trust Jesus Christ. And he says this in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. Through death, he rendered powerless the devil who had the power of death so that he might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. Dear friends, the life we live here on this earth isn't everything. The life to come on the other side of eternity, that's the only thing that matters. If this wasn't the case, 
Jesus wouldn't have come to this earth and suffered and died for you and me. Jesus came down to this earth to take as many people to be with him as possible for all eternity. And in a beautiful way, on Calvary, where Jesus died, we see a snapshot of this purpose playing out. There was Jesus having never done a single bad thing in his life. And hanging next to him on another cross was a man who had pretty much only done bad things in his entire life. And by the end of that day, that sinless man, Jesus, and that sinful thief, both walked hand in hand into paradise. And now Jesus is reaching out his hand to you, my dear friend, no matter how sinful you've been up to today. And he says, let's walk together. I lead you home. And in the next message, we look at how you can put your hand in his. God bless you.